Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching 1848, Europe's Year of Revolutions by Epic History TV. Yes, a new Epic History TV video. I'm very excited. Um, particularly, I'm excited because they're covering 1848. Now, I don't know too much about this year in particular, but it connects to a lot of things that I have an interest or expertise in. I'm really fascinated in modern European history, the Enlightenment, the development of uh, these ideologies like liberalism and nationalism, and as we'll see, 1848 connects to a lot of those concepts I just discussed, so I'm really excited to get into this one. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. 1848. More than three decades after his defeat, the shadow of Napoleon Bonaparte and the French Revolution still looms over Europe. And to be honest, it would loom over Europe for a while. I'm sure we'll get into this uh, in this video, but uh, this is exactly right. The ideology and the events of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars uh, really impacted Europe for decades to come. In fact, they still impact Europe up until today. So we got some, you know, really influential events, uh, and, you know, 1848 is very much tied up with those events. The peace settlement of 1815 had been a triumph for reactionary forces. Europe's great powers, Britain, France, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, were committed to working together to ensure no more revolutions. Yes, and this system, they might actually say this, but it was called the Concert of Europe. It was this geopolitical system where the great powers, uh, as shown on screen, would work together to maintain the status quo uh, and discourage, or frankly, eliminate any revolutions or uprisings. They wanted to maintain the monarchical status quo that they had in their countries um, because, you know, this uh, deal during the Congress of Vienna was made immediately following the Napoleonic Wars. Everybody was worried that, well, what if we see another French Revolution? Not necessarily in France, but anywhere throughout Europe. What if that spirals into violence and continent-wide warfare? Everybody wanted to avoid that, and so they established this Concert of Europe with the idea to maintain peace through a balance of power. Um, and it was relatively successful for a while. Radicalism and republicanism would not be allowed to disturb the peace of Europe again. Yep. Austrian Chancellor Prince Clemens von Metternich is regarded as the architect of this new conservative order. Mm -hmm. Some historians call it the Metternich system. And yet, across Europe, there are many for whom the ideals of the French Revolution remain not a nightmare, but an inspiration. Oh yeah. I mean, during and immediately following the French Revolution, um, many of the ideas of the revolution were discredited um, to a lot of people throughout Europe. You know, they saw um, where that radicalism had led to the mass violence of the terror, uh, and the continent-wide Napoleonic Wars, and a lot of people wanted to avoid that. But, you know, particularly as time lengthened um, between present day and, you know, the revolution, a lot of people started to think, you know what? Maybe they had some good ideas. And a lot of people still believed in the ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity. So while the revolution did, uh, you know, discredit some of those ideas in the minds of many Europeans, not everybody. You know, many radicals still existed. Many people still genuinely believed in those principles. Liberals seek personal freedoms and civil rights, such as equality before the law, protected by constitutions, a free press, and regular elections. Mm. Nationalists share these aims with a desire in Italy and Germany for national unification. And this was really one of the new movements we were seeing around this era was nationalism. And, you know, modern nationalism, um, you know, the French Revolution played a big role in developing that. Uh, and what we see as we get into sort of the mid-1800s is that alongside liberalism 
nationalism is now a really prominent ideology. Um, I mean, throughout Europe, but particularly in the places they've highlighted, Italy and Germany, because as you can see at this point, there was no country of Italy or country of Germany. It was a bunch of states, um, you know, broken up, but the people that inhabited these states were all Italians or Germans. Uh, of course, there were other ethnicities and peoples living in these areas, but primarily, say, the Italian peninsula was inhabited by Italians. Uh, and so these movements sprung up where, say, the Italians or the Germans, they wanted their own nation state, like, say, the French had. You know, uh, you have France, it is a state for the French. That's sort of the idea. And so the Italians and the Germans wanted that. Uh, and, you know, this nationalism would become a really powerful force by the middle of this century, as we're going to see, I'm sure, in this video. Or in the multi ethnic Austrian Empire for greater recognition, autonomy, and respect for language. Yep, so nationalism, you know, would push for the unification of the Italian and German states. Uh, nationalism would also eventually break up the multi-ethnic empires, like the Austrian Empire. At the moment, um, nationalism mainly encouraged the different ethnicities of the Austrian Empire to fight for more autonomy within the empire. Eventually, nationalists would push for full independence. Poles continue to seek the restoration of an independent Poland and have launched one bloody uprising against the Russians in 1830. Yep. You know, somewhat uh, inspired by the Decemberist uprising, which we saw in another one of Epic History TV's videos. We have sort of been keeping up with Poland a little bit through their videos. We saw in the Napoleonic Wars videos how Poland had been partitioned by its neighbors, and then uh, under Napoleon, many Poles had fought to get themselves a country, to reestablish a Polish state. Then at the Congress of Vienna, they, you know, a Polish state was created, but it was basically under the rule of the Russian Tsar. Um, it was supposed to have a liberal constitution and autonomy, but of course the Tsar ignored all of that and it was integrated into the Russian Empire. Their cause is supported by liberals across Europe. In most countries, liberals and nationalists face draconian censorship laws, mm. arrest by the secret police, and bans on political parties and meetings. Yep. But there are always loopholes. In France, private banquets turn into political rallies. In Italy, scientific societies discuss politics, while gymnastic groups do the same in Germany. Yep. These liberal movements are dominated by the middle class, with their own local and national agendas, but also many shared values and aims. They are passionate, organized, and waiting for their opportunity. Hmm. Very true. Very astute observation from de Tocqueville, who was uh, a pretty astute uh, intellectual and writer, um, you know. And you can see he said that in early 1848. That's exactly right. You have this dracon draconian system of censorship where the free press is being censored all across Europe. Liberal societies have been banned. And so, you know, does that prevent, you know, liberals and nationalists from organizing? Of course not. They just organize secretly. They have, you know... These other organizations, like, for example, as they mentioned in Germany, gymnastics organizations, which are secretly political organizations, or they have these secret revolutionary societies. Uh, the Italian peninsula had a lot of these, uh, these revolutionary societies who were ready to take up arms uh, and fight for their country. Um, so, you know, clearly the tension was building and Europe was about to explode. But it isn't just the middle classes that want change. Yep. By 1848, rising populations and food prices had created hunger, poverty, and social unrest across Europe. Low wages and hunger drive peasants to cities in increasing numbers, where they become cheap labor to feed the growing pace of industrialization. 
Yeah, and this is around, like I said, when we see um, the beginnings of serious industrialization. Now, industrialization had been happening for decades up until this point, particularly in places like Great Britain, but for the rest of Europe, it took them a little longer to catch up. But, you know, by the mid-1800s, we do start to see the development of the urban working class. And remember, uh, the mid-1800s, that's around when Marx is doing a lot of his work. And, you know, he obviously writes about capitalism, industry, the proletariat. Um, and so this is kind of stuff that is starting to develop. We see the urban proletariat who will become, you know, a political class in their own right in the following years. Now, we're not quite at that point yet, but we're in the infancy. That stuff is very, uh, in the stages of its early development. They live in slums and work long hours in dreadful conditions, if they can find work. Yeah. Violent protests by workers and peasants are on the rise. Harvest failures and potato blight make a bad situation worse, with a deadly famine in Ireland and food riots across France. Yeah, well, uh, sometimes you'll hear the 1840s called the Hungry 40s. That's a nickname because of crop shortages throughout Europe. People did not have enough food, uh, and poor people didn't have enough money to buy food. Of course, the most serious example of this is the Irish potato famine, uh, obviously made worse by uh, the inaction and action of the government uh, in Britain, um, that, that was, you know, uh, an absolute, you know, tragedy, you know, millions uh, fled slash died. Uh, that is the worst example, but we're seeing that sort of starvation um, throughout Europe. You know, there's a food shortage everywhere. And, you know, if you look at history and we look at revolts and revolutions and unrest, oftentimes that kind of stuff will be based in access to food. For example, Prior to the French Revolution, the price the price of bread was rising. Uh, people, poor people, you know, couldn't afford to purchase food, and so they were starving. Uh, and so that was one of the contributors to the French Revolution. Uh, and we're seeing the same sort of circumstances building here. In the face of such crises, Europe's governments offer little support or hope of reform. <laughs> the hungry forties. There we go. Um, and like they were saying, Britain's the best example of this, but governments across Europe did not do a great job responding to the hunger of the masses. When French Prime Minister François Guizot is mm. challenged that only the richest half percent could vote in France, he merely replies, Enrichissez-vous, get rich. <laughs> in the winter of 1847-48, a sharp economic downturn throws thousands more out of work. The case for reform is more urgent than ever, but Europe's governments fail to act. Yep. The stage is set for a European revolution. While the governments are still being run, uh, and these countries are being governed by those same old farts who had dealt with the Napoleonic Wars, and so, of course, they want to hold on to their power and they want to prevent the warfare that they had seen uh, a few decades earlier. Um, so they don't want to do anything that will risk unrest, revolution. They don't want to risk any reforms because that could lead to further radicalism. They would rather sit on their hands and do nothing. Uh, unfortunately, through doing that, they are encouraging the very revolution they seek to avoid. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The All right, you guys know the deal. Uh, shout out to Epic History TV. Um, please go and check out their video, which I have linked down below. Go and give them a like, subscribe to their channel, check out their sponsor, um, and show them some support for making these fantastic videos. For sponsoring this video. In southern Italy, the kingdom of the two Sicilies is ruled by Spanish Bourbon king Ferdinand II. His disastrous agrarian reforms have united Sicilian landowners and peasants against him. 
his kingdom will witness 1848's first revolution. Mm. In Sicily, furious crowds chase Bourbon troops out of Palermo, and the island declares independence, re-adopting its liberal constitution of 1812. And, you know, it's interesting to see there's clearly a lot of elements inspiring uprisings here and throughout Europe. You know, there's the economic element. Um, you know, people cannot afford to feed themselves. Um, there's frustration with the government, who is often a government run by a foreign monarch. Um, and this, you know, sort of liberal principles that people hold. So they want to establish constitutions and elections. And then, of course, that ties in with the sort of growing nationalism. They want either their own country or a country run by their own people. You know, all these factors sort of tie together and contribute to these revolutions, um, but also make them very complicated, um, as, you know, we'll get to. Revolutionary fervor spreads to the mainland. Mass rallies in Naples force King Ferdinand to issue his own constitution. In Piedmont, Sardinia, the threat of revolution persuades King Carlo Alberto to grant a constitution, and there are celebrations in the streets of Turin. Mm. Across the border, in Austrian-ruled Lombardy, Venetia, Italian nationalists revolt in Milan and Venice and drive out the Austrian garrisons. But as dramatic as these events are, they're about to be eclipsed by news from Paris. As always, <laughs> yeah, this is a very famous quote, of course, from Metternich. <clears throat> Since France's 1830 July Revolution, the country has been ruled by Louis-Philippe, the so-called Citizen King. Mm -hmm. He's a more moderate figure than his Bourbon predecessor, Charles X, but he opposes further reform despite the growing economic crisis. Yeah, so, you know, following the revolution, uh, well, following the Napoleonic Wars, the uh, Bourbon dynasty is reinstated, and Louis-Philippe is uh, an alternative to that, installed in 1830. He's a more liberal, moderate king. Um, but, of course, for the French, he's still not enough. Um, he's still this sort of status quo monarch. And at this point, the French people, they need a lot more than that. His prime minister, Francois Guizot, is hated. When he bans the banquets that are really opposition rallies, angry yeah. crowds march through Paris, chanting, down with Guizot, long live reform. Hmm. Guizot resigns, but it is not enough. Nervous troops fire on the crowds. 52 civilians are killed. Louis Philippe loses control of the capital. And as the mob advances on the Tuileries Palace, he abdicates and flees to England. Well, <laughs> I guess Louis Philippe didn't learn enough of a lesson to save his government, but he clearly uh, read his history enough to know that he should get out of there <laughs> before he got his head chopped off. Uh, as you can see, the Parisians are once again following the revolutionary playbook. Um, you know, storm the streets, set up barricades, fight with the troops, storm the Tuileries Palace. Uh, you know, we've seen it all before, uh, though Louis Philippe, like I said, is smart enough to get the hell out of there. A new provisional government is formed. And from the Hôtel de Ville, new foreign minister Alphonse de Lamartine announces the Republic has been proclaimed. Mm. France's monarchy has fallen in just three days. Again. <laughs> the news is carried across Europe by the new telegraph system. The effect is electrifying. Now, I mean, just imagine you're in Europe at that moment. It, it must seem like you were literally about to get a repeat of the French Revolution. King is gone. Republic has been proclaimed. I mean, everything is happening again. Um, you know, it's, you know... They say history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. But I imagine if you're uh, a European who's getting this news, you're probably thinking, well, history does repeat. We're getting the same events again. And so you might be thinking, well, if you're a conservative, you might be thinking, oh, God, <laughs> what sort of violence and warfare could this be leading to? If you're a liberal, you might be thinking, here's an opportunity. 
the French have risen up again. Maybe we could rise up in whatever country you're in. <laughs> Damn. 75 year old Austrian Chancellor Prince Metternich is among the first to be informed of the revolution in Paris. Mm -hmm. His police chief assures him there's no chance of such a thing happening in Vienna. <laughs> but on the 13th of March, around 4,000 students, inspired by the news from Paris, march on the Landhaus, the assembly building, and force their way in. There's a confrontation with troops who open fire and kill four. Vienna's workers side with the students. Mm. Much of the crowd's hostility is directed at Metternich. When the state council suggests he resign, Metternich meekly agrees and heads into exile in England. Which is already a pretty big deal given that Metternich, I mean, he is the, I mean, he's at least seen as the inventor um, and he's definitely the main force behind this conservative geopolitical system that was established following the Napoleonic Wars. He's the main figure behind it. Um, he is one of the elder statesmen of Europe. Um, not to mention that, you know, Austria is one of the most conservative of these old monarchies throughout Europe. It really uh, is a very traditional state. Uh, and so we're seeing a revolt and a revolution against those. That's, uh, that's a pretty big deal. It's also interesting to see that Louis Philippe and Metternich both fled to England, um, which I think is sort of a common theme we see for political exiles. Uh, you know, following this point, or in the modern era, political exile from continental Europe, get to England. They'll allow you to stay. One of the most extraordinary political careers in Europe's history, spanning 40 years, comes to an end. Yeah. Wow. Emperor Ferdinand suffers from epilepsy and a speech impediment and is a largely passive figure. Mm. But when his council announces there will be elections for an assembly that will draft a constitution, crowds cheer him in the street. Hmm. The secret police disappear. Censorship is ignored. The people of Vienna celebrate. Wow. I mean, and, and there you go. If you're standing there at that point, I feel like you've achieved a lot of your goals pretty easily. It took, um, you know, some protesting, a bit of a revolt, but the emperors basically agreed to your demands. You're getting what you want. Nationalists within the Austrian Empire are also inspired by events. In the Hungarian parliament, politician Lajos Kossuth makes a fiery speech denouncing Habsburg absolutism as the pestilential air which dulls our nerves and paralyzes our spirit. Mm. His speech is printed and circulated widely, inspiring others across the empire. Hungarians launch their own revolution, with 12 demands that include greater autonomy, a free press, and parliamentary reform. Czech liberals in Prague form a national committee and also send their demands to Vienna. There is even a Romanian nationalist uprising in the Ottoman province of Wallachia, forcing the abdication of the local prince. Hmm. Yeah. Across the smaller states of Germany, rulers face popular demands for reform. Most quickly grant concessions to avoid losing their thrones. The black, red, and gold tricolor, symbol of a united Germany, is prominent among the crowds. And there's our, you know, modern German flag, uh, the German tricolor, I guess you could call it. Um, you know, I'm sure we're all familiar with the French tricolor, which became a major symbol during the French Revolution. So, you know, we see a lot of uh, influences taken from that. Germany's first ever National Assembly meets in Frankfurt with elected delegates from across Germany. They debate how they will achieve the liberal dream of a unified Germany and begin drafting its national constitution. In the Prussian capital, Berlin, students and liberals are thrilled by developments and celebrate Metternich's fall. King Frederick William IV promises reform 
but also moves extra troops into the city. <laughs> yep. Tensions escalate between Berliners and soldiers, and on the 18th of March, protesters erect barricades. The army attacks, leading to vicious fighting in the streets. 800 protesters are killed. The king Jesus. loses his stomach for the slaughter and withdraws troops from the city. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, I mean that's a major slaughter. Um, you know, oftentimes when we see a, a situation of protesters fighting with troops or soldiers firing on protesters, we get a couple dozen, but this is a lot more. Promising a new constitution. Ah, uh, here we have Nicholas. Now, if there is <laughs> the arch-conservative state of Europe, it is Russia. You know, Russia is the conservative powerhouse of Europe at this point. Um, you know, for a few decades, basically, since the Congress of Vienna, Russia's been sort of the conservative uh, enforcer of Europe. They have been one of the main powers keeping the conservative status quo in place. Um, and it makes sense if you think about it, if you look at the Russian government, the Russian political system at this time, uh, it is absolutely one of the most conservative absolutist systems in Europe. Um, I mean, even by the middle of the 1800s, they basically still have a system where the czar has absolute power, whatever he says goes. Uh, even some of the more conservative states um, in other uh, throughout the rest of Europe are a little more liberal than that. Not all Europe is embracing change. <laughs> In Russia, Emperor Nicholas firmly opposes any reforms. Yep. He'd been badly shaken by the Decembrist revolt on the opening day of his reign. I mean, yeah, the Decembrist revolt challenged his reign as soon as it began. And then only a few years later, as we saw earlier, he faced the Polish uprising. So he's already faced two of these liberal revolts, and he wants nothing to do with them. Since then, he has tightened censorship and created a new secret police unit, the Third Department. Yep. There is a crackdown on all suspected subversives. Writer Fyodor Dostoevsky is among those arrested and subjected to a mock execution before he is exiled to Siberia. Yeah, and this was one of uh, the Russian government's favorite tactics for dealing with dissidents. They would arrest them, interrogate them, all that stuff, uh, and then they would get ready to execute them, either by firing squad or, or uh, bring them to the gallows. And at the very last second, they would announce, you've just received a pardon from the Tsar, you're gonna be sent into exile instead. Um, so they wanted to scare the hell out of uh, these dissidents before they announced that they weren't actually going to kill them, they were just going to exile them. Um, although, of course, they did also commit actual executions sometimes. There will be no concessions in Russia. Nope. Never are. By European standards, Britain is already a liberal constitutional monarchy, and the middle classes broadly accept the status quo. Yeah. But there is a popular movement calling for more democratic reforms. They're known as the Chartists for the six-point charter they wish to implement. Yeah, uh, in contrast to the rest of Europe, Britain's, Britain has a process that is more similar to the United States, for example, where over time they slowly expand their democracy. Um, you know, there's some popular unrest, but they manage to avoid a serious revolution. Um, and, you know, slowly grant more democratic rights and civil liberties. Um, but like I said, that doesn't avoid all popular unrest. And when the rest of Europe's going up in fire, of course, people in Britain are going to take notice. A mass rally is organized for the 10th of April in London. This is a photograph of that meeting. Wow. The authorities fear violence and draft in 80,000 extra police but the event passes off peacefully. In the Netherlands, King William II backs a new constitution and reforms, successfully preempting any revolutionary disturbance. Smart. <laughs> With fortuitous timing, 
Frederick VII of Denmark had abolished royal absolutism in January, so also avoids revolution. And in this case, that's really the smart thing to do. Um, you know, you're getting these uprisings throughout Europe. Um, the people want these reforms, and if they don't get them, they're going to fight for them. So honestly, <laughs> the smartest thing to do at this point is to give some concessions. Now, of course, that comes with the risk of if you give some concessions, what if the people fight for more? And, you know, you keep giving concessions until you have nothing left. That's definitely a concern if you're a monarch. But to avoid this sort of violence and popular revolution, I think, at least at the beginning, you're better off just giving some reforms, at least. But he faces a German nationalist revolt in Schleswig-Holstein, which leads to war with the German Confederation. Mm -hmm. Denmark will ultimately prevail in this war, thanks to diplomatic support from the other European powers. Yes, um, this region will come back again uh, in the future. Uh, it will be relevant to the uh, movement of German nationalism once again. In 1848, Polish hopes were high that these revolutions would pave the way for the restoration of an independent Poland. And they're showing it on the map, but look how absolutely massive pre-partition Poland was. I mean, um, prior to the partition, Poland had been in decline for a while, but, you know, fast forward or move back maybe 100 years before that, Poland was a major power uh, in Eastern Europe. And now they've been reduced to, um, you know, a client state of Russia or part of the Russian Empire, basically. Um, they have no autonomy, no power of their own. They're under the complete control of the Russian Tsar. And this is what they want to reclaim. Now, that realistically is never going to happen. Even today, Poland is not nearly that big. But they can still hope for a nation state of their own. And that's what they've been fighting for for decades at this point. Europe's liberals, after all, had frequently expressed enthusiasm for the idea. But in reality, no major power is willing to risk confrontation with Russia for the sake of the Poles. No, it's just too dangerous. But they are right that the independence of Poland had been a cause among uh, European liberals for decades at this point. Um, probably because, you know, everyone could remember, especially a couple decades ago, when Poland was still a country. And so since Poland had been partitioned, um, liberals across Europe had been arguing that a Polish nation-state should be created. A Polish rising in Posen is put down by the Prussians, while the Austrians deal with risings in Krakow and Galicia. Mm. The first euphoric phase of the European revolutions becomes known as the springtime of the peoples. Mm. With censorship relaxed, there's an explosion in the number of newspapers. Among them, Cologne's radical new daily, Neue Rheinischer Zeitung, ah. <laughs> edited by Karl Marx. Uh, there we go. I, I talked about him earlier. <laughs> this is, of course, a name we will be seeing many times again throughout European history. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to think that Karl is around at this point. Um, he is sort of in the early years of his uh, career. Um, of course, he will end up being very important. <laughs> it feels like the dawn of a new era. But these early successes are built on the back of an uneasy alliance, yep. as Marx is quick to highlight. Yeah, and... Um, we're going to get to it, but this is what I was saying earlier about how there were a lot of different interests um, or factors that inspired these uprisings, and that would end up making them very complicated. You're going to see how some of those interests would end up conflicting, and how some of the groups who supported these revolutions would end up in conflict. Middle-class liberals want constitutions, more inclusion in politics, and a free press. Mm -hmm. Workers, who are the revolutionary foot soldiers in many cities, want cheaper food and the right to work. Yep. German radicals sum it up with a neat pun. Freedom to read versus freedom to feed. 
I think Europe's that's exactly. I think that's exactly right. Uh, and we saw a bit of this during the French Revolution, but this is decades later, um, and the urban working class has developed a lot since the French Revolution. So they are a much more powerful force than they once were, and they have some ideas that are very much. Uh, in conflict with the liberal principles at this point. And so they can definitely work together against the conservative status quo, but what happens when it's just them left? Can they still work together, or are they going to start to drift apart? New assemblies are under pressure from conservatives who think they're going too far, and radicals and socialists who think they're not going far enough. Most horrifying of all to Europe's middle class there hovers the threat of mass direct action. Yeah, the uh, I was wondering if they're going to mention this, but the Frankfurt Parliament was called by detractors, radicals, socialists, um, those who wanted more. It was called the Parliament of Professors. Um, you know, sort of this idea that, yeah, the Parliament's just these liberals who want to read theory and write their constitutions. They don't actually want to do anything. Whereas we, these detractors, you know, we want to have real change. We want to feed the people. And this is where, you know, the split starts to show. And of course, these liberals in parliament are absolutely horrified <laughs> with the idea of a mass uprising. Um, you know, the people rising up to, um, you know, seize food um, or, you know, rising up sort of on their own initiative and without the cautioned and sensible leadership of the liberal elite. Social revolution. The mob. Yep. That sums it up well, bread or lead. In the wake of the revolution, France's provisional government had set up national workshops, a mm. public works program to alleviate unemployment in Paris. But just three months later, a new, more conservative government announces their closure. 100,000 workers are suddenly jobless. Yeah, and whether you think the national workshops are a good idea or not, I mean, they were certainly flawed. Um, but regardless of how good an idea you think they are, given that they were already established, I feel like anybody can see that it is a really risky move to get rid of them. You've just put a ton of workers out of work. They were occupied working in your national workshops, uh, and now they're out on the streets. Well, these are French workers out on the streets. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to cause trouble, and that's what they did. The response is immediate and furious. Yeah. Over three days in June, Paris radicals take on the middle-class National Guard and regular mm. troops in a bloody battle of the barricades. The Archbishop of Paris attempts to mediate, but is cut down in a crossfire. This remarkable early photograph shows some of the Paris barricades fought over that summer. Can I just say, it is fantastic that we have early photographs of these events. I mean, the, the photographic evidence is just really fascinating, and I think really brings it to life in a certain way. By the time it's all over, General Cavagnac's troops have killed at least 1,500 workers and Jesus. arrested 12,000 more, a third of whom are deported to Algeria. He believes he has saved France from anarchy. <laughs> the sacred cause of the Republic has triumphed, he declares. Jesus. And so we see in 1848 this division between, you know, the workers and the middle-class liberals. Now, we saw some of this during the French Revolution. Um, some of the more moderate liberals were also very terrified of the mob, um, and they worried about the same things that these liberals worry about. But generally, um, back during the days of the Revolution, the saint culot in Paris would generally work with the most radical of these bourgeois liberals. Um, at this point, now we see that, you know, the working class, the working people of Paris are now in direct conflict with these bourgeois liberals. Uh, their ideas, their principles are in conflict, uh, and now they are fighting each other. Uh, they fought the conservative order together, 
and now they've turned their weapons on each other. Um, although, of course, uh, mostly <laughs> the liberal bourgeois turning their weapons on the working class because they are in control of the National Guards and the police and the militaries. Uh, they have uh, far more arms and ammunition than the working class people out on the streets do. The French Revolution has split between left and right with bloody consequences. Yeah. It paves the way for the return of a famous name from the past, promising unity and order. Mm -hmm. That spring, conservative governments had been caught off guard by the speed of events. Now they begin to fight back. <laughs> In Prague, Czech students clash with troops. The wife of Austrian commander General Windisch Gretz is killed by a stray bullet. Yikes. He responds by withdrawing his troops and bombarding the city's old town with artillery. Jesus. 43 are killed before the students surrender. In Italy, King Carlo Alberto of Piemont Sardinia has declared an Italian war of liberation against Austria hmm. and invades Lombardy Venetia. He is supported by the other Italian states and nationalist volunteers, including the Italian Legion, led by professional revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. Garibaldi is a really fascinating figure, a professional revolutionary, one of the most influential Italian revolutionaries of this era. Um, so yeah, he's, he's an interesting guy. And as we can see here, we have that other element of nationalism really coming into the picture where, um, you know, we have these states being able to unify uh, and the monarchs of some of these states even on board with this nationalist mission. Um, so it, it can be a unifying factor which can triumph over perhaps some of the dividing factors like, you know, the liberal order versus the conservatism of these monarchs. Well, if everybody can agree that, well, we need Italian unification, then at least we can fight towards that together. Austrian forces in Italy are commanded by 81-year-old Field Marshal Radetzky, a distinguished veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. Vienna orders him to negotiate. Instead, Radetzky wages a masterful campaign, fending off the Piedmontese advance, then launching a decisive counterattack. Damn. Piedmontese forces retreat in disarray, and Carlo Alberto negotiates a truce. That summer, Johann Strauss composes the Radetzky March to celebrate <laughs> the old general's victory. I uh, just, uh, just enjoying some music now. <laughs> Meanwhile, Austrian relations with Hungary are in crisis. The country is now effectively independent, with its own elected parliament and a prime minister, Lajos Batyani. Yeah, Hungary was always the biggest threat to Austrian power uh, within their own empire. There were other uh, nations within the Austrian Empire. We have Czechs, um, you know, we have Transylvanians. We have a lot of different groups. But the Hungarians were the biggest, the most established, and the most powerful. Uh, and they had had a degree of autonomy for uh, a while now. Um, you know, they had their own medieval institutions that they maintained. Uh, and so if there was going to be a threat, against Austrian power. It absolutely was going to be the Hungarians. But not everyone wants to be part of the new Hungary. Savage ethnic conflicts break out between Hungarians and Romanians in Transylvania. Yeah, and this is where the issues break out. You know, Hungary is the biggest threat to Austrian power from within the empire. But the issue is that, you know, I mentioned there's other ethnicities they're not necessarily interested in helping Hungary's national mission. Um, you have Romanians in Transylvania who, well, they don't want to be part of a Hungarian state. They'd rather be part of an Austrian state because uh, at least then they can perhaps get some autonomy from the Austrians. Uh, and, of course, if you look at this map, you'll notice that you know, we have Wallachia, Moldavia, Transylvania. 
These will be the three regions that combine to form Romania one day. But at this point, Transylvania is a part of the Austrian Empire uh, and a part of the Kingdom of Hungary established within the Austrian Empire. And Hungarians and Serbs in Vojvodina, leaving thousands dead. An even greater threat is Croatian General Josip Jelacic, mm -hmm. a fire-breathing imperial loyalist who takes matters into his own hands and invades what he regards as a renegade province. Yes. Yeah, Jelicic was a, a devoted man, you could say. Um, he is just going to go for it. <laughs> the Emperor still hopes for a peaceful resolution and sends a loyal general, Count Lamberg, to take command of Hungarian military forces. But on arrival, he's brutally murdered by a mob. Jesus. Appalled, the Imperial government declares war on the Hungarian revolutionaries. Mm. This, in turn, outrages liberals and radicals in Vienna. There is fresh violence on the streets, and the Austrian Minister of War is lynched. Troops evacuate the city, while the Emperor flees to Olmutz. Jelicic marches to the government's aid. He joins forces with Vindish greats. And now we get this really interesting interplay of these you know, principles and ideologies that I talked about earlier, um, you know, mainly liberalism and nationalism. So the Hungarians are motivated by primarily nationalism, but in Vienna, the liberals um, are still opposed to their government declaring war on the Hungarians, mainly due to their liberal principles. And now we have Jelicic, who, you know, is Croatian and is kind of seen as this uh, represent representative of Croatia at this point, he's teaming up with the Austrian government <laughs> to fight against the Hungarian national movement and also to fight against the liberal revolutionaries. Uh, it's just uh, really fascinating. Outside Vienna, and together they bombard the city. Then they attack. Because Jelicic, he is on the side of the government, but as they pointed out, he is uh, to some extent acting on his own initiative. And of course, his power base is back in his home country. Oh, well, of course, it's not his own country at this point, but back in his home region. Um, so, interesting. The October Rising is crushed with the loss of 2,000 lives. 25 revolutionary leaders are executed, including Robert Blum, a member of the German parliament in Frankfurt. Mm. He becomes a celebrated martyr of the revolutions. Yeah. With Vienna secure, the Austrian invasion of Hungary can begin. The Hungarians are heavily outnumbered. Budapest falls, and the Hungarian government evacuates to Debrecen. Mm. Following the violence in Berlin that March, the King of Prussia withdraws to his palace at Potsdam, on the outskirts of the city. Here he is surrounded by loyal troops and conservative advisers, including a 33-year-old aristocrat named Otto von Bismarck. Yeah, and at, at this point Bismarck is a bit of a wild card. Um, I mean, he is has royal favor at this point, but... He definitely does things his own way. Of course, if any of you are familiar with Bismarck, he will go on to be one of the most important statesmen of this century, and perhaps the most important statesman in Germany's history. He is basically the main mover behind the unification of Germany, the formation of the modern German state. So he will go on to be very important down the line. When asked for his view on what should be done, Bismarck says nothing but leans over to a piano and taps out the march of the Prussian infantry. The forces of conservatism are strong in Prussia. Mm -hmm. There is deep loyalty to the state and the king. Yeah, well, Prussia, you know, has these traditional institutions and this sort of traditional um, military establishment. So, you know, it really has the force to fight back against these liberal uprisings. 
allies, like Bismarck, adopt the enemy's tactics, launching conservative political organizations and newspapers to mobilize this support. Yeah, and Bismarck will retain this skill throughout his career. This is one of the things he was best at, in fact, was looking at what the opposition was doing and saying, can I learn from that? And then taking a bunch of the opposition's tricks and using them for his own movement, um, really you know, taking the wind out of the opposition's sails. Um, later in his life, he would do this in a more parliamentary <laughs> political sense. Of course, at this point, we were in a revolutionary moment. Um, but Bismarck was very skilled at that. I mean, overall, he was an extremely skilled political operator. By November, King Frederick William has noted the infighting of his opponents and the defeat of the Vienna Revolution and decides to act. Mm. He orders General Wrangel to lead 13,000 troops into Berlin. Of course, an added to bring the nationalist element back into it, an added threat for, say, uh, the monarchs of Prussia and Austria is that, um, you know, in Prussia um, and in Austria, at least in the Austrian segment of the country, their people are German. And a lot of the uh, liberal intellectuals of their countries wanted to join this uh, unified German state that was being proposed. They wanted to be part of this new Germany. Um, and of course, that's sort of an added threat to the integrity of the Prussian and Austrian state. Um, yeah. They enter the city unopposed and order the Prussian assembly to disperse. It has no option but to comply. Yeah. Prussia will get its constitution, but it is one handed down by the king under which he retains full executive power. Yep. Prussian dreams of a true parliamentary system, even a republic, are dashed. In December, two new players take the stage, who will play key roles in shaping the fate of Europe's revolutions. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand abdicates in favor of his 18-year-old nephew, Franz mm. Josef. He will reign until his death in 1916. In Paris, Louis... Just a note on that, Franz Josef will reign till, as I said, 1916. So he is starting his career during 1848, uh, Europe's Year of Revolutions, as Epic History TV calls it, and he will end his career <laughs> during World War I, uh, the biggest uh, global war seen uh, up to that point, of course. Um, what a career... <laughs> spans a lot of important events. He would have seen uh, many of the formative events of modern European history, and of course, been involved in many of them. Um, but I mean, we don't have time to go over his whole career now, but it is just fascinating that he ruled for so long. Napoleon Bonaparte, mm -hmm. nephew of Emperor Napoleon, is elected president of the French Republic in a landslide victory. Yeah, talk about the benefits of uh, name recognition, huh? He promises to heal divisions, impose order, and restore France to her former glory. Yeah, so as they mentioned earlier when they were sort of introducing him, he was supposed to be a unifying figure, like Napoleon. Um, I mean, you know, he related to Napoleon, he uses that name very prominently, he is styling himself after Napoleon. He wants to be this national unifier, you know, liberate the country, bring people together. That's what he is acting as. <laughs> yeah. In Italy, the tumult continues into 1849. In the Papal States, the reforms of Pope Pius had seen him held up as an unlikely liberal role model. But escalating radicalism and violence, notably the assassination of his justice minister, Pellegrino Rossi, caused mm. Pope Pius to flee Rome. That, I mean, him being a liberal reformer is very unlikely. I mean, popes are usually very conservative figures, and I don't actually know much about this pope, so I would be curious to learn a little more about what 
you know, reforms he took. Uh, but regardless of that, you know, the state of affairs has outpaced any liberalism uh, he could support. And we're getting far more radical at this point. In his absence, a Roman Republic is declared. Wow. It is led by Giuseppe Mazzini. Another very important Italian revolutionary, um, but also a Roman Republic. My God, how long has it been since we've seen one of those? <laughs> Talk about a throwback. This is a real throwback to, uh, to antiquity. The iconic figurehead of Italian nationalism, who's devoted his life to the unification of his homeland. Yeah. But elsewhere, the Italian cause fares badly. Carlo Alberto resumes his war with Austria, with disastrous consequences. At the Battle of Novara, Radetzky inflicts another heavy defeat. Damn. Carlo Alberto abdicates in favor of his son, Vittorio Emanuele, to avoid mm. a republican revolution. Twelve years later, he'll become the first king of a modern united Italy. Yup. In the south, Ferdinand reverts to absolutist rule and sends troops to Sicily who stamp out the revolution. Then, to the dismay of liberals across Europe, French President Louis Napoleon sends troops to crush the Republic of Rome and put the Pope back on his throne. He has decided the support of French Catholics is more important to him than the fate of Italian Republicans. Yeah, so Louis Napoleon would disappoint a lot of people. Um, you know, he acted as this unifying figure, but with his actions, um, he really could not garner the support of everybody. It probably would have been impossible, but he leaned more to towards the conservative or moderate side of things. And so, uh, you know, like I said, people ended up being very disappointed with him. <laughs> French forces are led by General Oudinot, son of the famous Marshal. Wow. Rome's defenders are led by Garibaldi. But despite skilled and courageous resistance, Rome is forced to surrender after a two-month siege. That summer, Radetzky also retakes Venice and puts an end to its republic. <laughs> wow, I mean... Obviously, I side more with the revolutionaries in this case, but Radetzky has really been putting a show on. I mean, he's really showed his skill throughout this entire campaign. In March, the German National Parliament in Frankfurt had finally agreed on a constitution for a united Germany. Mm -hmm. It is to be a constitutional monarchy under an emperor. The man... I wonder who the emperor is going to be. <laughs> Let's see who they chose. Intended to play this role is Frederick William of Prussia. Mm -hmm. So when he declines the offer, the plan is killed stone dead. Yeah, that was a pretty big L. Um, but they chose him because, one, he was um, a very powerful, perhaps probably the most powerful German monarch. Um, the only competitor would be the head of the Austrian Empire, but of course... The Austrian Empire was far more multi-ethnic than Prussia was. Um, and so the idea was get the most powerful German monarch um, to rule over a unified Germany. And hopefully this would also encourage Frederick William to allow Prussia to be brought in to this unified German state if he could rule over it. Um, but he declined. Um, you know, he was not interested in being handed the crown by this group of uh, liberals. Uh, you know, he, if he wanted something, he would get it for himself. In public, he says it is impossible without the consent of the other German princes. In private, he says he would never accept a crown from the gutter, mm -hmm. disgraced by the stink of revolution. I was hoping we would get to that quote. That's what I was literally just referencing. He won't accept a crown from these people. Um, he's frankly disgusted by the notion. Um, if he wants the crown, he'll seize it himself. He can do what he wants. He's the king. Um, so that, that's sort of the attitude he's running on. <laughs> Revolts in support of the national constitution break out in Saxony, the Palatinate, and the Grand Duchy of Baden. Mm. They are crushed by local forces, assisted by Prussian troops. 
the Frankfurt Parliament itself is dissolved. What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal constitution lies in ruins. Yeah. In Austria, the new emperor, Franz Josef, issues his own new constitution, reclaiming almost all political power. He also revokes all the liberal reforms passed by the Hungarian parliament, known as the April Laws. So he's sort of playing both sides. I think he's doing it intelligently. He's both giving concessions, but standing firm on other things. Uh, in, you know, uh, trying to keep his throne. In response, Lajos Kossuth declares formal Hungarian independence, and the country begins an extraordinary campaign of military mobilization. Yeah. Hungarian commander, General Gergely, retakes Budapest. He then launches a bloody assault on Buda Castle, overpowering its Austrian garrison. In desperation, the Austrian Emperor travels to Warsaw to formally request military aid from the Emperor of Russia. And this is what I was talking about earlier, you know, why would he even do that? One, uh, you know, it's not as odd as you might think. I mean, we've talked about this established conservative geopolitical system, the Concert of Europe. The whole goal was to work together to prevent liberal uprisings. But also, I think I literally used the term earlier that Russia was the conservative enforcer of Europe. So if there was anybody to go to to help you uh, save the monarchy and the conservative status quo of your country, it would be Russia. You know, Russia would be the country to help you. Russian troops have already moved into Moldavia and then Wallachia to put down the Romanian liberal revolution. Now, of course, there's always a risk. Um, Russia wants to grab more territory and they may not give their help away for free. In fact, they definitely won't. They'll want something in return. Uh, and sending Russian troops or inviting Russian troops into a territory, <laughs> you very much, much risk losing that territory to the Russians. Now, you know, there's less of a risk if you're the Austrian Empire, but it is still a risky option to go with. Nicholas now agrees to send troops to Hungary to crush those he describes as the enemies of order and tranquility. Hmm. Hungary faces an impossible strategic situation, surrounded and outnumbered more than two to one. The combined onslaught is irresistible. The Hungarian forces are driven south and finally forced to surrender. Mm -hmm. In the aftermath, around 120 Hungarian politicians and army officers are executed. So ends Hungary's War of Independence. Proud on, as it says, French socialist, a very influential early socialist. I mean, Marx would, of course, become the most influential socialist in history, but he wasn't the first to do it. Proud on was influential early on. In fact, he was influential throughout the 19th century. Um, you know, Marx would become more important, but, you know, if you're interested in that history, Proud on something to look into. Eighteen forty eight was a year like no other. A series of seismic political events following one upon another like falling dominoes. But what had been achieved? <laughs> a British historian famously described eighteen forty eight as the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. Mm. And for all the euphoria of Europe's springtime of the peoples, by eighteen forty nine. It seemed that the counter-revolutionaries had won everywhere. But some gains did endure, such as the abolition of serfdom in Austria and the popular vote in France, though France became a little less democratic in 1852 <laughs> yep. after Louis Napoleon made himself emperor. Like I said, he very much styled himself after Napoleon, um, along with making himself emperor. Um, interesting guy. <laughs> Across Europe, governments modernized 
and paid more attention to economic and social issues, partly in response to the new challenges that had emerged from socialist and working-class politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, from this point onwards, the working classes will only get more radical. Um, as at this point, there's still sort of this liberal revolutionary spirit, though the working people are sort of advocating for this social revolution. Of course, following this point, uh, socialism uh, and then Marxism will begin to become very popular uh, among labor organizers uh, and working people, and that will become the new sort of ideology of that class, um, and which obviously puts them into even more conflict with the liberal uh, middle class. Uh, and the ruling order, which would be a bourgeois ruling order. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't want to uh, say anything they're going to say, but in terms of what was achieved through the 1848 revolutions, uh, in the short term, not much. You know, the revolutions were crushed. Um, but if you look at the goals of these revolutions and then look uh, at longer term European history, Italy would soon be unified. Um, you know, it would take Germany a little bit longer, but Germany would also be unified into a single state. Um, you know, the Austrian Empire would become, uh, you know, a, a dual monarchy with Hungary. So a lot of the goals that these revolutionaries fought for, they would not achieve in 1848, but eventually they would get to them. Liberalism would spread throughout Europe, countries would become more democratic, constitutions would be proclaimed. So a lot of these changes, sure, they would be crushed at this point, but over time, uh, these reforms would happen. The causes of German and Italian unification had been defeated, but made giant strides and learned yeah. crucial lessons. Their goals would not be achieved by ideas alone, but the realities of force. Oh yeah. Yeah, these unifications would not be achieved by ideals, uh, or particularly in the case of Germany, by liberal revolutionaries and idealists. They would be achieved by realpolitik. Um, they would be achieved by, uh, you know, the government or the status quo, you know, like in Prussia, uh, the Prussian government and men like Bismarck, who were at the top of the hierarchy, being in favor of unification. That's how they would be achieved. In the words of Bismarck, the great questions of the day were to be settled not through speeches and majority decisions, mm -hmm. but by iron and blood. This is also a very famous quote. And to be fair, like I said, um, the Parliament of Frankfurt, um, you know, its opponents, including uh, these radical leftists, I guess, uh, radical working class people, they criticized the Parliament of Frankfurt, and they called it the Parliament of Professors. They had the same critiques. You know, they were tired of the Parliament making declarations and writing constitutions and giving speeches. You know, they wanted to act. Um, and Bismarck, obviously, is coming from the opposite directions, but, you know, he thinks exactly the same thing. If you want to achieve these political goals, you're not going to do it through these liberal procedures. You're going to do it through action, through warfare. It would be wars waged by powerful monarchies that united Germany and Italy. Yep. The legacy of 1848, for good and ill, would be felt for decades to come. Oh my. How about that? <laughs> um... You know, go check out their merch store and all their stuff. Uh, once again, show them some support. This was a fantastic video. Uh, I really enjoyed this one, uh, as you could probably tell. I apologize for, you know, yapping so much, but I find this a really uh, fascinating topic. Um, it's one that I do know a bit about, and it also just gives me an opportunity to talk about basically this entire century of European history and the previous century, particularly the French Revolution. I think there's a lot of interesting factors at play. You know, sort of my main focus is modern European history, particularly uh, the 18th and sort of early, mid-19th centuries. And so I find the development of a lot of things that will come to be important 
like uh, modern states, the development of nation states, the development of nationalism, liberalism, socialism. This stuff is really fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Uh, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.